Okay, uh, we're here this afternoon at the Bees of PPWG talking to Professor Claudia Aradow of King's College London. Uh, I'm going to be asking her about uh, some of her recent work, uh, her work on methods, on big data, security and the role of, of ethics uh, and her views on the post-structural tradition. Uh, this will be the third in our uh, series of interviews here at the PPWG. So let me thank you so much once again for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I'll turn now to the first question, if I may. So um, what, in your view, um, have been the central contributions of post-structural IR in the last several decades? Um, and how do you think scholars using post-structural methods of various kinds um, can fruitfully chart courses forward um, with a view to responding to some of the contributions and sometimes challenges posed by other critical traditions in the field? Um, first of all, thank you very much, Abby, for the invitation and um, making time and organising this, making time to um, talk together. Um, Post-structuralism, I think, um, I, I'm not sure how many decades back I, I can, um, you know, look at and um, think about what post-structuralism brought to IR. Um, I'm thinking of post-structuralism and international relations as a sort of um, fraught, you know, relation in a productive way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think post-structuralism has actually shifted what international relations as a discipline is and mm -hmm. what it does. Um, so I think probably um, IR is completely, or most likely IR is completely different mm -hmm. now um, from decades back. And mm -hmm. I think there are, I would say, probably three um, or four key contributions that I see. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk a little bit about what the limitations are and what some of the criticisms to post-structural approaches have been. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me that primarily or one of the key contributions um, to international relations is, is to ask this question about making or fabricating mm -hmm. right um, concepts, the international um, and a lot of um, the work in post-structuralist um, approaches has tended to emphasize, for instance, questions of performativity of discourse, questions of discursive practice, and we see this also in um, work that's closer to um, my, my own research around critical security studies, right? Mm -hmm. So where this concept shift, um, how we analyze what international relations and what international politics is about. A second element, I think, um, a second shift that post-structuralist approaches have brought is this very location of the international, right? So this is, is quite connected to questions of making, mm -hmm. of fabricating, right, the kind of, um, but also potentially unmaking. Um, so if we think traditionally of the language of levels, for instance, that is used so much in international relations, so we've shifted, or post-structuralist approaches have shifted that, have challenged it, um, have blurred, have helped us blur some of the boundaries but also rejected um, some of the binaries that are used in, um, you know, in international relations. So this very question of location of the international location of politics is approached very differently if you start thinking about the international as being enacted, as a practice, as emerging, right, through what people do um, in different sites. Mm -hmm. A third element that I think is very important um, that emerged in um, post-structuralist research has been this question of subjectivity and related questions of agency, right? Mm -hmm. Where do we place agency in international relations? What does it mean to um, analyze international politics started from um, the question of agency? And this is very much connected also with debates around what politics is about, what do you see politics, again, the location of politics, politics as a concept, but also if you recall, I mean, I recall, I'm old enough to recall 1990s debates about the distinctions between um, politics and the political that mm -hmm. I feel a lot warier about today. It's, it's not a distinction I would embrace, um, though I probably used it as well, <laughs> um, exactly because of this binary. But we can see these distinctions being played um, again, right, in some of the more recent engagements with focus on Bourgeois Grancier's work, where we don't have politics and the political, but police and politics, yeah. right? So some of these binaries uh, come back. Um, but I think we need to challenge them uh, a bit more. Mm -hmm. And then if you take each of these shifts, right, you can then think about where the limitations are and where some of the challenges have um, come in terms of 
other approaches that, um, you know, other critical approaches that engage with, mm -hmm. um, you know, post-structuralist thought and post-structuralist research in international relations. So I'm thinking here primarily, for instance, about the question of the location of agency, mm -hmm. right? What is happening in terms of how we study agency, where we see agency, where is the agency of the subaltern, right? This is one of the critiques. Um, that Tarak Barkawi and Mark Leffy have raised in terms of the erasure of um, agency, right, and a kind of a location, Eurocentric understanding of agency. And you can see that, um, you know, emerging, but also um, as a key thread in, um, I think, post-colonial, but also mm -hmm. um, decolonial work. Then you will have questions around politics, so we can take them um, and start looking at that, um, you know, kind of this different criticism, but also ways of creatively moving IR uh, in different directions. I'm thinking also of new materialism and some of the debates about mm -hmm. um, against um, questions of agency, but not just agency, but also um, questions of the making, the fabrication, how do we analyse that, what is the role of objects, of materials, of the equipment that we have. Mm -hmm. um, right engagement with science and technology studies. So again, a lot of kind of um, limits, but I think also the opening of a very different space, right, a creative space to do IR differently. Mm -hmm. uh, to turn now to the second question, you recently um, published a very interesting article uh, with Tobias Blanco looking at uh, algorithmic reason and uh, big data. So I'd like to ask about um, the ways in which you frame the changing character of the self-other relationship in that article. So as many in post-structuralist IR will, um, will be aware, oftentimes this relationship is framed in, a term, in terms of a logic of difference equals danger. And this has been elucidated variously looking at hierarchical relations of friend and enemy, of difference identity, and so on. And so you and, and your co-author argue in this piece that the rise of big data brings about a fundamental shift in this idea of the self-other relation towards a logic of similarity-dissimilarity, and that this uh, kind of um, relationship is established through the, through the identification of data outliers and data anomalies. So what are or are likely to be, in your view, uh, the concrete consequences of this shift? I'm going to try to answer by looking at kind of three aspects of the article, um, which came out in the European Journal of International Security, as you said earlier this year. So one is methodological, because I think there is a shift that we make um, in relation to how we analyse the production of um, others right, and, and the figure of the enemy. Um, a second one is about the political implications that you referred to and a third one is about um, our critical concepts and what it means to produce critical knowledge. So methodologically I want to go back a little bit because um, you know, we are inspired by an article that was published in the 1990s by the historian and philosopher of science Peter Gallison, which is called The Ontology of the Enemy. And in it, Peter Gallison actually attends to how um, cybernetic um, thought and practice enacts a particular figure of the enemy. And he juxtaposes it, or rather opposes it, um, to widely circulated uh, figures of the enemy at the time of the Second World War, right? So racialized um, renditions of the um, enemy other, um, the German or the Japanese, um, also the evil other, right? So a very kind of extreme figure of the other uh, that you have in political or media discourse and so on. And he opposes this to um, cybernetics where a much more kind of anonymous figure of the other emerges, you know, and there's a lot of research on understanding the, you know, the pilot, the enemy pilot, um, very different right, from media and political discourses. So methodologically, I think it's really interesting what Gallison is drawing attention to, which is the, the coexistence or the production of multiple figures and visions of the other in different social fields. Mm -hmm. So we take this to actually think about an emerging social field where we have the kind of um, computing expertise and computing knowledge coming together with security knowledge and security practice. Right. Mm -hmm. So we are asking what is happening there when we have um, this discourses of finding the needle in the haystack, right? So the terrorist is now the needle in the haystack. How is this um, kind of uh, produced, right? How is this fabricated through this computing knowledge? And we find this language of anomaly detection and the anomaly 
as being the needle in the haystack and try to pursue it, to try to understand what this figure of the other is. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So we um, argue that there's quite a different figure from um, the figure of the enemy. The figure of the enemy is seen in, in this um, relation of the front of enemy and enemy, but also the relation of identity and difference. So politically, I think, to move to the second um, element in terms of uh, political implications, one of these political implications is that our language of friend and enemy or identity and difference doesn't quite fit, right? So if one thinks about this um, production of similarities and dissimilarities, we're always we're similar in some ways and dissimilar in other ways, right? And it's very difficult to criticize this on the basis of identity and difference. I mean, we're saying, of course, the figure of the enemy doesn't disappear, but some of the uh, concepts that we associate with identity and difference and that we might try to actually mobilize to uh, argue against the homogenization of the other or so on, just don't work in these big data practices, right? And that connects to the third element, which is about the production of critical knowledge, right? Um, I think that two elements here. One is how we think about um, the production of the other than a, as an anomaly through this kind of continuous calculation of uh, similarity and difference, right? And what kind of moves then happen to make the anomaly, to make the outlier into an enemy, right? We can also think about the proliferation of outliers and what that means in terms of you know, people who are targeted, right? Targeting, right? This proliferation has important political consequences, right? But also the, the continuous change of, of what counts as an anomaly. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of really difficult to then challenge, right? The production of our lives or anomalies through the mm -hmm. kind of political means that we have, whether in courts or whether publicly, um, and so on. And thirdly, I think that you know, concept, and to me this is really important for critical international relations, that there are no safe concepts, right? So there are no concepts that we can take for granted, these are critical concepts. Um, there's been recent work that tries to claim similarity as a more progressive concept, right? Um, for critical thought that, for example, identity or difference, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's really interesting to, to actually analyze the production of concepts within fields of practice, where similarity it's not necessarily, it's a particular kind of way of knowing, right, um, that produces um, political consequences that we need to engage with. And it's asking to both um, situate this production of concepts and production of knowledge as a practice, but also think about enlarging our own conceptual and analytical vocabularies, right, not to be stuck to some extent in what's been a dominant language mm -hmm. um, in critical IR or the kind of dominant way of analysing these relations um, to try to understand how heterogeneous these practices are, right? But how they have effects in terms of people's lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so your work in uh, the area of, of security and big data um, and indeed in other areas is clearly ethically motivated. Um, and yet you tend to frame your interventions in terms of the political rather than the ethical. Um, could you expand on why that is um, and how you conceptualise and negotiate the relationship between the political and the ethical? I feel like I'm now really on difficult territory, right, because this is such a big question and I, as you say, I try to um, place myself or place my work in relation to politics and thinking about political consequences of practices um, rather than ethics, and this mm -hmm. goes back quite uh, quite some time, um, which is maybe differently from the kind of junction of the two that you have in post-structuralist thought, where we talk about the, as well, that talks about the ethical political, right? Mm -hmm. So the two are kind of joined together. Right. Um, well, for me, I think um, there are two different starting points, right? Um, analytically but also politically. So for me an inquiry that um, starts with politics is an inquiry that attends to power and practice. Right? It starts from this messiness of power and practice in different social fields, um, which ethics does not, does not give me. So if you think about a lot of the debates about ethics, we have the language of ethical responsibility towards the other. Right? Um, so it's a language that that somehow is also abstracted from this messiness, uh, dirtiness of practice, but also from power. It, it kind of 
acts in relation to, right, an intention to some of these power relations. But for me, it's about where you start, what you look at, what you analyze, right, what you get. And it's, um, you know, kind of starting with politics is also attending to struggle, to modes of appropriation and reappropriation, to forms of resistance, um, to controversies and, and so on, right? To, to frictions, to um, people doing things in different sites, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is not to say that you can't, you know, that some of these kind of um, agential modalities um, are not associated with ethics, but I think it's very different once you talk about ethics, you do not start with struggle, or at least in kind of my engagements that I've mm -hmm. seen so far. It's, um, it's not primarily, you know, your conceptual toolbox, right? The toolbox that um, Michel Foucault talks about is not kind of equipped with, um, you know, controversy and struggle, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's differently equipped. It leads you somewhere else. So there is a second reason why I don't use ethics, and this kind of takes me back to our earlier discussion about how concepts emerging practice, how they are situated. Right? So we see ethics, or at least a particular conceptualization of ethics that has become incorporated in practice of security um, war. We, we see it in my own research, for example, engaging with digital technologies now and the kind of mobilization of digital technologies in security governance. Um, ethics is, is very much part of right, the very operation of digital technologies. Um, so in that sense, ethics has become a concept of governance, and that kind of takes me, um, in a sense, away. So ethics from ethics, ethics understood in, in, a, in a particular sense, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I think overall, in kind of my work, I, I stay with the messiness of uh, politics, but also the struggles over um, power relations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in addition to your research on security, uh, technology, big data and, and the other things we've spoken about so far, um, you've also published important work on scholarly methods and methodologies uh, in IR. Um, what advice or suggestions would you have for scholars and students uh, who perhaps struggle with elucidating and justifying their methodological commitments, particularly those working in critical or post-structural domains? To me, it's interesting, right, that we think of post-structuralists kind of struggling with methods, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly students doing post-positivist or post-structuralist work struggling with methods, because for me, a lot of post-structuralist thought is full of methods, mm -hmm. right? So from deconstruction, right, to kind of the very different modes of discourse analysis to Foucault's genealogies, and there's so much method. Mm -hmm in post-structuralist thought. So I think that the change with what you're saying, in a sense, is this fraught field that, you know, students or, you know, young scholars enter, or, you know, scholars enter, when on the one hand, um, you have to deal with the strictures of a discipline that's kind of um, structured in particular ways with particular demands on what counts as matter and what counts as valid research. Right? And the history of post-structuralist um, thought, that kind of own history of methods, right, that does not kind of abide by this criteria of va validity, mm -hmm. right? um, it kind of works in different ways and we've had some of these debates about how do you think about these uh, different criteria. But also the impulse in a lot of critical thought there is the, an impulse, a creative impulse, right, to actually break even further, right, to invent new ways of doing research. And this is very hard to do because you are basically trying to enter and shift, right, the ways in which a field, an academic field, so, you know, our discipline is being structured. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think that international relations is still one of the disciplines that's kind of most open to some of this creative, disruptive, methodological work. Mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a recent article called Assembly Credibility, Jeff Heismans and I tried to take issue with this question of how we produce validity, right, for, and how critical knowledge comes to claim validity in terms of the method work. And we see at, at the beginning of the article, we kind of try to categorize the different strategies that um, you know scholars have used in international relations 
to claim validity for critical work. And you have this very much validity is often um, claimed in relation to method, right? So you have to kind of first strategy, do the methods that are there, right? Claim the scientific method and validity through the scientific method. And you have some of this move to make more scientific or sci scientific, 25, what's the right verb? <laughs> Just don't know, it's a tricky one. Scientificize? Scientificize, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you know, yeah. our work by claiming um, mm. you know, um, scientific methods. There's a second move where there's an attempt to actually claim different methods, mm -hmm. right? Different qualitative methods, post structuralist methods, and emphasize this difference. But there's also a third move to refuse right. Right, this claim to, to validity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we can talk about what, what each of those entails, right? but we can think about the move to openness and closure mm -hmm. that we have with each of these strategies, so we can think about what we lose yeah. and what we gain. But also if we think in terms of positions in a field, right? um, in a, and I'm thinking in quite Bourdieuian terms, right? the kind of capital that academics have in a field, it's also a question of who is able to challenge um, right, some of um, these conditions, some of the kind of governing structures around methods and so on, and who is not, right, and under which conditions. And it seems to me that one, some of the work, what I would say, some of the work that we need to do is perhaps collective, right? How do we support young scholars who want to challenge, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, what is taken for granted, some of these methods that they are supposed to um, use, right? right, right want to challenge the strictures of some methodological work and do more creative work. And I think this is where we need to do more collective rather than individual work, right? So it's kind of, I guess my advice would be find some friends or allies, <laughs> right? <laughs> Talk about methods, try to, you know, set up, I don't know, I say palace or right set up collective work so then then collectively we can make some of these claims and um, there's there's another element in the article where we talk about you know assembly credibility also across boundaries across fields but we call trans epistemic right assembling of credibility so you can for example if there's creative work done in a different discipline or simply in a different field right you can work across right with some of um, these methods and practices to actually make them in your own discipline. So there's kind of a lot of work that can be done, like transversal work, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also I think collective work, right? Just basically, let's sit and talk together about it and <laughs> what we could do, right? So just to finish us off then, um, what direction uh, is your current research taking and what contributions are you intending to make with these upcoming projects? I wish I had a clear, straightforward <laughs> answer, and I hope if this is messy and unclear, it will actually help everyone who's not quite sure where their research is going. Mm -hmm. um, so let me... Can I organise it? Mm. Okay, I'll try. Mm -hmm. um, so one area of research actually um, it's very much connected to what you mentioned around algorithmic reason, the research around digital technologies and the production um, of knowledge, security, subjectivity through algorithmic practices. And this is a, this is a quoted book pro project with Tobias Blanca, which is provisionally called Algorithmic Reason, the mm -hmm. New Government of self and right? And the contribution is exactly trying to unpack some of these challenges and some of these transformations in how um, we are being governed, right? So all these digital technologies and algorithmic practices, but also how the relation between self and other, right? is transformed, mm -hmm. what kind of knowledge, what kind of practice, what kind of infrastructures are at stake, right? Um, and I think this is really important for, for international politics because um, a lot of boundaries have become fuzzier, right, around the circulation of technologies, around the production of um, international governmentality through big data, through these algorithmic practices, right, the production of security. So a lot of what we experience, right, in a lot of our lives, our political, social lives, are actually change through these practices. Mm -hmm. um, and we see this, right, from debates about, you know, how elections are run, 
Right? So if you, if you remember debates about Cambridge Analytica, right? so you used to think about debates about the elections as being quite boring, and all of a sudden, right? great excitement around elections and what is happening to elections and what it means to vote and um, be manipulated or not manipulated and what role data has um, to much more hidden practices that we associate with the field of security. Mm -hmm. not that, I mean, secrecy is kind of cuts across a lot of these practices, whether they are, um, you know, corporate practices or security practices. Um, so this is, this is one side which I think contributes both to um, critical knowledge and what it means to produce critical knowledge in international relations, but also engaging um, with questions about what it means to do international relations right? um, in, uh, in a digital age. And then the second um, enough element, which is very new, and it hasn't started, so I won't even attempt to say <laughs> um, what it will be about, um, is a continuation of the role of digital technologies and the production of data in relation to borders. Mm -hmm. right, so the ways in which borders are being governed today, or the ways in which some of the political debates are, are, are being shifted, is through the production of data, governing through data. And I'm really interested in trying to understand how the production of data about people who cross borders, so um, in this case irregular migrants, transforms their lives, but also transforms the very governance of borders more broadly. Right? What it means to talk about um, borders, border security, but also the effects um, for the lives of migrants. Um, and particularly what happens when as you move, data might be moving with you, mm -hmm. or might be moving behind you, mm -hmm. right? It might be moving as well, it kind of follows you, and then it, sh it shapes, you know, almost by anticipation what will happen next. Before you even sometimes, sometimes maybe before you even reach the next place, data mm -hmm. might have moved, might be there, before you are there, right? Um, so all of this, you know, transforms again, questions about the location of international politics, what we think, what we think about politics, but also questions of struggles, I think, mm -hmm. um, of subjectivity, you know, of how people can resist and engage with these processes. So this is something that I'm really, um, really interested in. And I'm also interested in relation to these practices of what is often called datification, right, the making of people into data. Right? Um, I'm interested in, in how these processes actually produce knowledge, but also produce more uncertainty, more ignorance, more ambiguity. So it becomes even more difficult, right? Both for professionals and um, you know for people caught in these practices to actually challenge them. So I'm really interested in in how we can think um, about. Regime, not just regimes of power knowledge, right, which is what post-structuralist work has been really good at, uh, but about regimes of power ignorance and mm. what it means when we govern through this regime, or you know, we are being governed mm. right, through these regimes of power ignorance. And I think we need again new analytical tools um, and new methods, perhaps, to actually understand what is entailed in these regimes of power ignorance. Mm -hmm. It's a great phrase. I like that. Well, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Claudia, for all of your uh, insights and all your views and for your thoughtful responses to our questions. Um, we've been delighted to have you here at the PPWG um, and we look forward to uh, airing this hopefully soon. So thank you again. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and uh, yeah, I look forward to you know, hearing more about what PPWG is doing. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers.